We would like to recognize the Algonquin Nation on whose traditional unceded territory the National Art Center is located. Nous rendons hommage à la nation algonquine en qui nous voyons une gardienne du passé, du présent et de l'avenir de ce territoire. Hello, everybody. My name is Alexander Shelley, and I'm the music director of Canada's National Art Centre Orchestra. To those of you who've joined us here before, a very warm welcome back to Musically Speaking. And for those of you who are joining for the first time, thank you for being with us and warm welcome to you all. During these sessions, I have the pleasure and privilege of talking to extraordinary and brilliant personalities from the music world. It's an opportunity to learn about their lives, their art, their craft and their music. And it's an, also an opportunity for you, our audience, to ask questions. So please, in the next hour, do be in touch via the chat boxes and we'll try to get to any questions that you might have. Um, and over the course of this Musically Speaking series, we've had a wonderful list of guests from violin greats like James Ennis and Daniel Hope to Indigenous singer-songwriter Jeremy Dutcher or to Canada's former Governor General Julie Payette. You can find those episodes and more by visiting the NAC website. So please do dig into the archive if you enjoy uh, today's conversation. Now on Saturday night, the NAC Orchestra and I should have been performing a live stream concert as part of our NACO Live series that we kind of created during this pandemic. The concert has unfortunately had to be canceled due to the extension of the provincial lockdown regulations here in Ontario, but would have been featured within the context of a professional development program that we designed in collaboration with young artists who would have joined us in person in Ottawa this week to perform alongside us. We were going to have welcomed five young string players, a composer, two conductors, a sound engineer, music administrator, uh, a music journalist to work alongside us and to take part not only in the performance, but in a wide variety of online seminars and workshops and discussion. Uh, this Musically Speaking was very much conceived as part of that program. It's an opportunity for all of us, but particularly perhaps the next generation artists to explore what's going on inside the mind of two very brilliant musicians because today is a I think a very special edition of Musically Speaking. I welcome two artists who are on the one hand utterly unique and yet on the other share so many touch points with one another. They're both great concert pianists with major international performing and recording careers. They're both brilliant improvisers uh, with the musical imagination uh, to traverse styles and, and epochs and each of them is building an ever-growing body of work um, as a composer. So Gabriela Montero, uh, with whom I had the pleasure of speaking in, in this series uh, before, that was in 2020, is a Latin Grammy Award winner, recipient of the fourth International Beethoven Award and the Rockefeller Award. She's an Amnesty International Honorary Consul. She's featured at the Women of the World Festival, uh, performed twice at the World Economic Forum in Davos, and has featured uh, as a performer at Barack, uh, Barack Obama's 2008 presidential inauguration. She's a pianist, composer, and one of the most exceptional improvisers I've ever encountered in my life as anybody has ever encountered. Um, so unique in fact is, are her skills that she was the subject of a functional magnetic resonance imaging fMRI investigation of her brain by Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore. She's also a regular and much loved collaborator with the NEC Orchestra and features on our most recent album performing Clara Schumann's Piano Concerto and a series of impro improvisations inspired by Clara Schumann. And described by the Philadelphia Inquirer as one of the best pianists of his generation and by the LA Times as a phenomenon who deserves wide attention, Stuart Goodyear is a Juno-nominated pianist who performs with some of the finest North American and European orchestras and around the world. His ever-expanding discography is a testament to the breadth of his musicality and of his brilliance and the brilliance of his musicianship. And we at the NEC are proud to call him a friend of the orchestras. Most recently, we here premiered his uh, extraordinary cello concerto written for our principal cellist, Rachel Mercer. And we look forward to featuring him on one of our own upcoming album releases. Uh, so please do join me in our virtual world in welcoming Gabriella Montero and Stuart Goodyear. Welcome to you both. Such a pleasure to be here. Hello, wonderful to be back with you, Alex, and to meet Stuart. Thank you, and sorry for the prolonged introduction there. Where, where are you both speaking to us from, Gabriella? I'm in Barcelona and have been here for a few months. Yeah. And, and, I'm, in, and I'm in New York. I've been here for around two weeks or so. Okay, and I'm right in thinking that you last night had an actual live performance. Yes, um, which felt very surreal, very emotional, and um, it was just a, a wonderful evening. 
you were at the 92 wine in, in New York. What, what was the 92nd restaurant? Street wine? All Beethoven, three sonatas. Mm-hmm. Which is kind of a, that's easy for you after the sonata thon. You, you, you regularly perform <laughs> all the sonatas on one day now, don't you? Oh, it's, 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 never, it's never a duck in water. It's always, um, I'm, I'm always in the ringer, but it's, it's, always a, it's always a great journey every time. Does it feel like something's missing when you, when you having played, you know, so regularly all of them in one day, when you, you, you then take three, does that feel like there's something absent? Uh, not anymore. It's interesting. When I was, um, when I first heard the sonatas, I heard it in one sweep from, you know, sonata number one to sonata number 32. I was a toddler listening to it and um, I was just so immersed in every, with every second of each sonata and captivated. And it was an important day for me because that's the day that I decided that I wanted to be a pianist and play this repertoire that I was um, absolutely in love with. But because of that, uh, my brain was kind of warped and thinking to myself, well, this feels like a long cycle. And I always heard it in my mind as this mammoth set. Mm-hmm. And playing one sonata made me feel like I was not being fair to the other 31 because it was showing so many different sides of Beethoven. Yeah. And we're so used to hearing, you know, the name sonatas or, you know, some of the big ones, some of the choice ones, but there are so many gems like um, you know, 10 minute um, mm-hmm. sonatas and others where you just see a jocular side, a vulnerable side, an intimate side of Beethoven. Mm-hmm. And so, for the longest time, uh, when I was touring with recitals, I was not even programming Beethoven because I'm thinking, you know, it was always a dilemma. What sonata would I program? What side of Beethoven would I feature? And then I thought, you know, right, enough of this nonsense. I'm just going to present it the way I first heard it. And my first um, cycle was in Ottawa, actually, at the ta- Chamberfest um, around 10 years ago. And then my first uh, one day marathon concert, I call it a sonata thon was in Toronto and I've done um, seven of them so far. And it's, it's, um, it's always interesting audience members coming back and they're saying, you know, this is the first time that they had this opportunity of hearing sonatas they, they never heard before. And um, it's, it's fascinating. All of the, all of the um, audience members have been introduced to Beethoven um, differently and they all have fascinating stories, very personal stories. And I love chatting with every one of them. And, um, last night, it was, um, I guess, a preview, um, th- a three out of 32, but it was um, touching on um, the th- um, three different chapters of Beethoven, um, early, middle, and late. And just that intimacy of, you know, there was only maybe, um, I think, 25 or, or, or less percent that were allowed in the hall. The rest was um, streamed online. But to be there with um, that group of people in that space, um, it felt so appropriate for, um, for there to be a, a one hour all Beethoven concert, like a, you know, finally we're coming back, we're seeing each other and slowly things are getting back to normal. And I think that we, we all felt that. That's beautiful. I'm, I'm so thrilled for you and for those, for the audience, I'm jealous of them. Gabriella, you probably for the first time in a very long time, in many, many decades of traveling and performing, you've, you've had some quiet over the last year. How, how has that been for you? Well, it hasn't been that many decades, Alex. But <laughs> <laughs> well, you're, you started very, very young. <laughs> but um, yeah, for the first time in, let's say, two decades, I, yeah. I was able to take a proper break. And... Uh, you know, we were speaking earlier about silver linings and this this year afforded me, um, you know, aside from all the challenges and the, you know, the, uh, the things that we've all suffered from, um, some time, some time to take care of myself, to, to um, get into exercise, to discover other kinds of, of joys and even hobbies. Um, which I, I would not have been able to, to do with the schedule and the, and the concert life that I had before the pandemic. So right now I'm at a point where a year and two months later, I really feel like going out on stage again and playing and somehow reaping the rewards of this year of growing and uh, feeling almost like a different person in a way. So it's, it's, yeah. There's an aspect of, I, I think, what's happened in the last year for some 
artists of, of kind of cocooning and coming out the other end as maybe something that's different from what went in before. Um, mm -hmm. And I imagine that we, we, I want to talk about it in the next uh, you know hour with you, you both, but for the two of you who are not just interpretative artists, but who are creative in the sense of improvisation, of composition, has that offered a kind of moment of solace, introspection mm -hmm. for you, Gabriella? Um, yes, I mean, in fact, I started uh, composing my piano preludes uh, a few months ago. And it's an interesting process because I can see how much I change and I grow depending on, on life and what's happening in life. And also having the time to reflect and having the time to just be. And uh, I, keep, I keep composing, you know, I have like 15 at this point and then revisiting it and changing it and just completely scrapping it. And again, I feel like one of these insane, uh, bespectacled, you know, composers of the 18th century just throws everything in the fire. Yeah, can't do, that, can't do that with a well, laptop, but you know, yeah. Yeah, well, this is, you know, you, you mentioned something that I, I want us to dig into because for me, you both represent something deeply authentic and yet somewhat rare nowadays, the, the improvising composer performer, which is part of this rich line and heritage from the earliest days of what we call classical music, you know, from, from yeah. back then through Mozart and Hummel and into Liszt and Schumann and Rachmaninoff and beyond. Um, and I want to discuss with you both uh, your relationship to that role and, and the, the, you know, mm -hmm. the effect it's had on how you've built your career and how you think about uh, the future. Mm -hmm. But before we do that, I want to just do something a little bit different for our, for our audience. Gabrielle, you've, you've done this before, um, which is to ask you some questions, a lot of which have nothing to do with music, but they're very fast, either or, just from the gut response. I haven't put any weird curveballs in there that you're going to look back on and say, oh my God, why did he? <laughs> I promise. It's just, I, it's a really, I find interesting insight into the sort of spontaneous sort of salt. So here we go. Stuart, night or day? Day. Gabriella, cave or open sea? Open sea. Stuart, silence or sound? Silence. Gabriella, would you rather play for a family member or for a stranger? Ooh, depends on the family member. <laughs> <laughs> we well, could discuss that at the table tonight together. Okay. No, maybe. Well, okay, I'll say stranger. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Stuart, uh, rhythm or harmony? Ooh. Rhythm. Rhythm. Gabriella, harmony or melody? Harmony. Interesting. Uh, Stuart, head or heart? I know you want to say. Um, I'll have to say heart. Okay. Gabriella, Beatles or Boulez? Beatles. Stuart, chamber or symphonic? Uh, symphonic. Gabriella, dreams or reality? Dreams. Stuart, home comfort or hotel hospitality? <laughs> home comfort. <laughs> okay. Gabriella, Louvre or Alps? Uh, Alps. Stuart, we're nearly there, guys. Revolutionary <laughs> or incrementalist? Wow. How to go revolutionary? Gabriella, globalism or localism? Mm. Oh, God, that's a loaded question. Uh, ah. <laughs> uh... Oh, there's such beauty in both. I don't know, okay. Global. That's fine, that's fine. Beauty in both, I think you're right, yeah. Okay, this one's gonna to come to both of you, but Stuart first. Popular success or the admiration of your peers? Mm. Um, we can't add a third one, can we? Sure. <laughs> Admiration of my family. Oh, that's beautiful. Okay. Oh. Gabriella, do you want to say the same thing or? So that, does that mean I would play for your family, Stuart, if I, if I choose that between a stranger, your family, and bring them back together? That is the rule. That is um, the rule. We, we are I, going to invite you over. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know. With that one, I, I, I guess hmm, maybe admiration of my peers, I guess. Yeah. Which, well, no, I wouldn't include my family. I'm not, I don't mean to exclude my family. It sounds 
Yeah, that one was a can of worms. I'm glad I don't have to answer yeah. it. I, I agree. It's a, it's yeah. a very difficult one because we we want both, right? But it's, yeah, yeah. That's, that's the point of this little game. Okay, Stuart, Dutch master or graffiti artist? Mm. Graffiti artist. Graffiti mm. artist. Gabriella, Cordon Bleu or Burger? Oh, Cordon Bleu. Venice, uh, Stu Stuart, Venice or Venice Beach? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I haven't been to either. What? I would have to, what, what I would dream about is Venice. Okay, mm. fine. Gabriella, then Venice or Vienna? Mm -hmm. Venice. Okay, Stuart, deadlines or freedom? <laughs> oh. Deadlines. <laughs> deadlines. <laughs> All right, Gabriella, which is more fulfilling, the process or the outcome? The process, definitely. Okay, so here's like some quick ones. Stuart, Bach or Britain? Uh, this is fun. Yeah. Oh, man. Dun, 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 That's right. Can we, can, we, can, we, can we add the composer of that theme? Because I, 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 I want to include that guy. Um, I'll, I'll say Bach. Okay, uh, Gabriella, Bach or Bartok? Bach. Okay, Stuart, Bach or Beethoven? Ooh. Uh. Bach. Okay, Gabriella, Monteverdi or Mozart? Mozart. Stuart, Mozart or Mendelssohn? Mendelssohn. Hmm. Interesting. Mozart's been knocked out. Gabriella, Mendelssohn or Mahler? Mendelssohn. Okay, so then we have the two finalists. Stuart, Bach or Mendelssohn? Bach. Gabriella? Bach. Okay, he's the winner. He's and the winner. Gabriella, if I'd asked you Bach or Mozart, which one have you chose, chosen? Oh God, until about a week ago it would have been Mozart, but I've changed, so Bach. Okay, okay. The last two questions, one, one each. Stuart, if you could meet and talk to anyone in history, who would it be? Uh, maybe Gandhi, yeah, but I don't know. Okay, <clears throat> Gabriella, just a, a big question. If you can give a, a quick answer to it or, or a succinct answer, it'd be interesting. What is music's greatest strength? Um, the the ability to um, it's a vehicle to to educate to inform to create empathy to awaken um, I think it's an incredible tool when used for good of course mm -hmm. can it be used for for evil oh yeah and it's been done yeah. continues to be done but yes definitely mm -hmm. so you're both these extraordinarily rounded and adaptable musicians and I'd, I'd be really interested to hear you speak to the the three descriptors that I used to introduce you both um, so that is improvisers composers and interpreters Stuart could you speak to the concept of, of improvisation as you feel it as you understand it it's um, organic music making um, you're basically creating you know, similarly to, um, you know, the questions that you asked, everything is from a gut level. Mm -hmm. And um, I guess the head and the heart question, that's when, um, that's when both are essential mm -hmm. because you're responding um, emotionally and mentally to all the surroundings. And then that's, that's how I would interpret improvisation. Okay, and G Gabriela, if you had to s sum it up, I know we, we've touched on this so many times before you and I, but if you were to describe improvisation to a kid, um, what, what words would you use to sum up that experience for you? That's a beautiful question. We've never really talked about it like that. Um, I would say that improvisation is an open playground where there are no rules, uh, where anything goes and any step you take in a direction can lead you into an unknown territory. And that's what's wonderful, that uh, there are no booby traps. <laughs> you just walk out and there's endless possibilities to play with. That's beautiful. 
and and so I, I described you both as improvisers, which of course you are. You're both composers. Gabrielle, could you pick up on that and say that describe what for you the difference is between your composer hat and your improviser hat? So so if you were to to look at that open playground, um, no booby traps, no wrong steps. Mm. Could you describe now composition for us? And Stuart, I'm going to ask you the same as well, by the way. <laughs> well, my improviser hat is basically, that's who I am. The composer hat has a few hidden pockets in it where I take out little tools that I use to shape and to craft, you know, how I want uh, the improvisation to, what I want it to become. But essentially, any composition that I sit down and actually physically leave on, on well, won't say paper, on a screen, is, um, is all, it always begins with an improvisation because that's my nature. That's my relationship to music and I can't help that. I can't, I can't go against it. I can't change it. It's just my, my nature as a human being. Stuart, is, is, would you concur? Is that your process too? Or? Um, it depends when I'm, when I'm writing for, um, other um, ensembles as opposed to when I'm writing for piano. Piano, um, a lot of my ideas come from improvisation when it comes to the piano. When it comes to chamber writing, um, it's like another hat altogether, it's another aesthetic, but um, um, I live for as many booby traps as possible when it comes to composition <laughs> because I'm thinking, all right, um, just thinking outside that level of comfort and um, seeing where my mind takes me. Um, and then after that, how to sculpt that. Mm. So that's, you know, that's what I look for when I write. When, when I write. Uh -huh. and, and finally, I, because we're gonna sort of refer to these terms in our conversation. So we've had improviser, composer, Stuart, interpreter. Yeah. When you, you think of yourself as, an, yourself as an interpreter, what words come to mind? Again, if, if we were to try and articulate it to a, to a child to make evident what a, an interpreter does, how would you how would you describe it? Marty McFly in a time machine, going to various periods, going back in time, thinking that it was all a dream and remembering what the trip was all about, and okay. then just going from there. Cool, Gabriella, would you want to take a stab at it? Um. Uh, it, it's funny because when I think of performing works of other composers, there's something of a paint by numbers that I would say to a kid. You have the drawing, you know, you know it's not your drawing. And what you're doing is adding your colors and you're adding your design within the framework of what already exists and it's not yours. Very different to improvisation. So. Basically, it's about making that, that painting uh, your own through the process of internalizing the piece and then bringing through your vision and through your life experience the piece to today and to today's world and to who we are today. I, I find, um, Gabriela, when we work together, the, um, when, when I witness you improvise and when you know, I, we've known each other for many years now and I've seen so many occasions where you have conjured something from, from nothing, literally, or, or, or someone gives you a, a strand of a theme and, and you go into this world for 10 minutes or five minutes or whatever. Um, and uh, even though you, of course, this miraculous concert pianist and interpreter of other people's music, there's always a bit of me that sees you as a caged tiger when you're playing someone else's music. And so the, the paint by numbers thing, I find is an interesting, there is a, you, you said it yourself, there's a kind of, okay, well, I, I'm just gonna fill this in now. It's such a different process, at least when I observe you um, uh, doing it. But let, let's touch on that. In our previous conversations, um, we talked about uh, the, the Johns Hopkins uh, fMRI study of your brain. And, and I remember you saying that between interpreting and uh, improvising, actually two completely different parts of your brain light up. I think you said it was the visual cortex that, that is engaged when you improvise. Um, do you, I, I know what I think about this observing your concerts, but do you feel that audiences respond differently to hearing you improvise or interpret? You're asking really good questions, Alex. Hey, you. thank you. <laughs> I love it when we go deep into these questions, you know? Um, 
Absolutely, there is a difference and the public senses it because as you say, I, I, I am kind of a caged animal when I'm playing, uh, you know, other composers works. Mm -hmm. And again, it's just my nature. I, I, I want to open it up. I want to explore. I want to communicate and give in a different way. And my creative brain, like, as you said, the visual cortex somehow wants to take over. Um, and the public, I think you can't fool people. You can't fool the public. And, and even though I'm really invested in performing the classical works that I play, you know, the, the big repertoire, there is something that happens to me, and that could be neurological, it could be mystical, whichever way you want to interpret it. Something does happen to me that I connect to music in a, in a, in a, in a different dimension when I'm improvising. Um, I don't, I don't, I can't quite explain what it is, but my search all these years has been to bring that Gabby into the performing of other composers, Gabby, you know, to marry the two in the best possible way. And I have all kinds of different, you know, processes that I go through and questions. And I, I even feel in my, in my head, I feel a shift. I used to feel a physical shift when I'm doing one or the other. Mm -hmm. So um, it has to do with my eyes. It has to do with what I'm focusing on. I, I don't know, it's, it's a very strange thing, but, but yes, the public, the public, you, you, I mean, you've heard it, you know, I play yeah. player of mine of Ravel, Mendelssohn, you know, Clara Schumann, whatever. And there's, you know, big applause, but then I improvise and something happens communally Mm. And that's also part of it, I think, which just brings it to another level of excitement. And um, Stuart, I, I, I read that, I mean, it may be that this was just an anecdote that was, was framed in the wrong way, but I read that your, when you describe your first experience uh, improvising, it was at a Curtis Institute party where they'd, they'd had they, 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 that's not your first, okay, because it was Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer that you did like in different styles. <laughs> so no, this, this was um, an anecdote. It's a nice anecdote, but it's not true. Okay. I started improvising when I was three. I, ah, started, you started, like, I started playing by ear. Mm. And before I was um, learning pieces by various composers, I was always improvising on the piano. Which is Gabriella, what happened to you too, right? Exactly. Yeah. exactly. Um, I never, um, improvised publicly mm, I see. and um, I never I don't know it, it was always like um, an intimate secret of mine that that I would improvise at conservatories I don't know why I just um, I just wanted to keep it um, only mine mm -hmm. and then when I was in um, Philadelphia as a Curtis Institute which was um, always steeped in tradition and everything, you know, the P's and Q's, the T's were crossed. And I don't know, in that environment, um, I was so happy that I had, you know, I loved Curtis, don't get me wrong, I really enjoyed it, but I was so happy that I also had another sound world from my high school. So um, I went to a Quaker high school where there was lots of hip hop and lots of R&B and going from there to the world of Brahms, the world of Bach, the world of Beethoven. And you know, hearing hearing my peers perform and um, interpret other people's work, and every Christmas there would be this party where um, students would let their hair down, as it were, and come up with kind of SNL like skits, mm -hmm. and it was always inside jokes about Curtis and this, that, the other. And for some reason, they asked me. They uh, I was elected to do a skit. I thought, well, I'm not particularly funny. I don't know what on earth I'm gonna be doing. But I knew um, uh, for fun, if there were friends of mine that came over, um, I would have a, uh, there would be like either Super Mario Brothers or something like that. And they would always want me to do it in the style of Bach or in the style of Beethoven. And so I thought, you know what? Just right at the spur of the moment, I was still backstage, not, still not knowing what I'm gonna do. I was like, you know what, I'm just, this is, a gathering, this is like a living room setting. Let's not even forget about the skit and everything. Let me just share this um, for the first time. And um, rightfully so, um, all the students and the teachers were very, very skeptical because they never, they never heard me do that before. 
And so I said, well, all right, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, that's our, that's, that's our theme. And I want all of you to shout out um, composers that you wanted in the style of. So I was like, oh, okay, yeah, Stuart is gonna do this. All right, Pelestrina, <laughs> Danakis, um, Schoenberg, Webern. And I knew all of these um, composers um, growing up and listening and you know, loving all so I knew the harmonies and I knew um, a lot about how those composers would write for piano. So I just thought, all right, if I was wearing the hat of Schoenberg, yeah. how would I uh, do Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer in his voice? Yeah. And so it made me comfortable to share that mm. with the public. So then when it came to orchestral engagements, um, doing Mozart, Concerti, I was um, honoring tradition and improvising my own cadenzas. Mm -hmm. But so far, I have never done a program where it was only my improvisation. Mm -hmm. And that will um, th actually the first time doing that will be on on the on the Johannes Clara mm -hmm. and Robert um, project oh. where um, I will be really taking the plunge and improvising like I used to as a toddler. And as you know, Stuart, the, and this is part of the beauty of this conversation is that Gabriella on our first disc did precisely that. She linked the works as we would have experienced in a concert back in the day. Yeah. Written down works with improvisation with, and, and it, it, I, I just find it works um, so beautifully. I'm also hoping that a bootleg of your Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer will turn up at some oh, point. Oh, it's probably somewhere. somewhere we right got to right. trawl through our, our Curtis context. <laughs> um, I, 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 you know, I fell in love with jazz when I was a, as a kid and Oscar Peterson and, and Bill Evans and so on and so forth. And, you know, I've been a, a dilettante jazz pianist ever since. But I found that my exposure to jazz and then through jazz, pop keyboards, you know, I had a band, all the stuff that you do when you're... It completely transformed my relationship to classical music, which had been my first language as a child, and, and moved it into a place that I, in retrospect, feel is far more authentic. It's this connection with the, the bones of music, realizing that the stuff that's added on top is kind of, you know, it's the, the flesh and the hair and the skin. It's not necessarily the essence. And that's the beauty I find of jazz and, and working around forms, yeah. is that, that is the piece. You know, if it's Summer of the Rainbow, it's this set of chords and it's this melody but then you can go in any direction with it. Um, and I find that, that that alters one's approach then to learning um, the standard, in inverted commas, repertory, the way one connects with it. Do you both, all, you know, bearing in mind that you, you both obviously had an innate gift for translating something in your head into an instrument, and it, it started so young with both of you, but do you feel like um, the study of improvisation should be more present in classical studies for instrumentalists nowadays. Uh, Gabriella, do you want to maybe? Um, I see that there is a huge movement of um, including improvisation in conservatories, and I, I think it's a wonderful thing. Now, I, for me, to to speak of studying improvisation is, is kind of a, a paradox mm -hmm. because I have always said you can't teach something that doesn't exist. You know. And, and I, I think, you know, in my case, for example, because I never learned what the chords were called, I never studied harmony, I never studied counterpoint. I mean, my, my weird musical thing comes from the ether. I mean, it, it really, there's, there's nothing I can hold on to. Um, mm -hmm. So I, for me, it, it's a different kind of language. Nothing is there. So I don't think you can, you shouldn't be able to teach improvisation. You should just, you should be able to be immersed in music and, and it's a language that you kind of float in and it's, it's, it's around you. But I don't think you can pinpoint and say, okay, this is, this is how we're going to construct an improvisation because then it stops being an improvisation. But, uh, so I listen, I, who am I to, to question anything you say about improvisation, but one observation, Again, I, I had somewhere over the rainbow on my mind because a couple of days ago I recorded just a four minute video for our patrons, uh, an improvisation on it. And I was like, I, I just sort of started off and um, and at the end of it, I thought, you know, I quite like that actually. I thought that was quite a nice little improvisation. And then later on in the afternoon, I was like, 
it really reminds me of something. I and and then I realized that there's this there's this classic Keith Jarrett somewhere over the rainbow from Japan or something that I'd heard years ago, and I'd basically created a very poor pastiche of a thing that I'd heard before. So, Stuart, I want you to to, to speak to this question of improvisation, but also a question for both of you. Where does pastiche end? Because we all have sounds in our head and chords and progressions and things. And where does improvisation begin? And I know that that's an impossible question to really answer, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on that because that's always a question for me. How much of what I think I'm creating is simply a pastiche or something that is already in my head? Yeah. Stuart, do you wanna? I think, um, again, improvisation um, to me, is never, um, um, going back to what Gabby was saying about being taught improvisation, being taught at a particular school or being taught one certain way of doing it is just another way of placing some something in a bubble. Mm. And I think with improvisation, that bubble has to be burst so that there are so many, um, so many various possibilities. And I think if one is in a bu bubble, it is so easy to get into that pastiche mentality where you're honoring tradition mm. and um it stops being like an improvisation as it is you're, you know it's like you're interpreting again mm. mm -hmm. interesting mm. there's a question uh, for you gabriella uh, from uh, bruce neal which came actually a while ago before before i even mentioned jazz but how would you approach jazz improvisation or what do you even understand by that term jam, jazz improvisation as opposed to um, well, let me say, first of all, that you are a very fine pianist, so I, I've heard you play, absolutely not, you are, you are, so just for everyone to know. Second of all, I think some of the greatest, greatest, greatest uh, creative minds of all history are jazz musicians and Brazilian musicians. I mean, I was listening to, um, uh, to a, a, re a recording of um, uh, Jobim just a couple of days ago. Oh, he's extraordinary. So yeah. cool! I mean, so yeah. cool. This this world is incredible, and 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 unfortunately, I mean, I would love to see the classical world learning more about those worlds, and and even in in classical yeah, yeah. curriculums. Absolutely. I mean, why do we have to create the bubbles, like like you said, Stuart? You know, and and I I do love that improvisation is is now uh, spoken about much more often as something important because it gives. Uh, the musicians a different scope of what that written score is really about, you know, which I is couldn't agree more. Yeah. From different angles. And as far as uh, jazz improvisation, it's, it's just like, it's just like you speak French and you speak Italian and maybe you speak Russian. I mean, it's, mm. it's just a different language, but in the end, it's, it's how you process it that matters, you know. Through well, then I think that's a really nice analogy because uh, if you speak, if, you, if we're speaking English to one another, just because all the words have existed before and probably even the sentence I'm saying now has been said in exactly the same way, it doesn't mean I'm not improvising this conversation. It doesn't mean I'm copying something that came before. Mm -hmm. So I think that language uh, analogy is a lovely one because I've, I've heard you so many times on stage, you'll, you'll get a theme and you, 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 it'll go into your head and then I hear you, oh, she's gone Italian or she's gone French, you know, that equivalent. And then sometimes in the middle of it, you'll change language into something else. And that's when the audience goes nuts, you know. But, but actually you, you, you touch there uh, and, and I am thinking there of, of another facet of, of both of your minds and your musicianship. On the one hand, you, you know, you're highly trained in the very demanding and wide ranging classical repertoire. But but you both celebrate the cultural influences of your heritage, of your childhood, really quite actively. I mean, Gabrielle, I've heard you so many times move into uh, your, your sort of home Latin American idiom in improvisation and in the music that you then compose. Stuart, yeah. one of the things I have like on repeat at the moment on my phone is Congate, which is one of Stuart's most recent releases is a kind of Calypso fusion number with his, his rock quintet. Um, I know we've sort of touched on it, but when you're thinking about your careers, so not just how you make music, but when you're thinking about careers, do you feel like these are musical gardens that need to be sort of walled off from one another? Or do you, do you both feel comfortable um, saying, I am all of these things all the time? 
-hmm. because I imagine it's also quite complicated building a career and, and creating the identity um, there. You've both done it and I marvel at it, but have, has it been challenging? Stuart, do you want to start off with? Well, I think, uh, well, I live for challenges. So um, I think, um, you know, the challenge, uh, you know, like as a, as a Beethoven interpreter was um, for people who think that Beethoven interpreters have to come from a certain country or, mm -hmm. you know, have, um, you, know, you know, a look of, you know, of, of, that describes a certain, certain pedigree. I didn't fit into that mold. So that was, um, that was a challenge that I, I definitely took the plunge to, um, to face, um, being a love of uh, a lover of classical music and uh, being steeped into that world, but at the same time, I come from a very eclectic background where my childhood soundtrack was Calypso, um, Led Zeppelin, Joe Cocker, mm -hmm. Blood, Sweat, and Tears, and Ravi Shankar, mm -hmm. and. Um, I think throughout my whole life, I never believed in walls. I never believed in gardens, you know, mm -hmm. being separate from each other. You know, I loved, um, I loved color, mm -hmm. you know, from, from the very beginning. And I love traveling, I love exploring, and I like learning so much. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess the challenge in an environment where it's decreed that you have to be in one place, you know, I was, um, I was definitely, uh, I was definitely not that person. Mm. And I think for uh, um, the journey on setting your, you know, your life as a musician, where you want to go, what your goals are, as soon as you um, build that road, it takes care, like a garden, it takes a lot of care, it takes time. Mm. But ultimately, I think it's just more um, rewarding because I mean, I, it's, it's very authentic. You're very true to where you want to go and you're not compromising. As, as a music yeah. fan, um, I can say that I, I gravitate constantly. Also in my collaborations musically with, with, yeah. with artists such as yourselves, both of you who are, I think the word holistic is, right. I, I've, I've never come into, a music, into contact with a musical language that hasn't in some way uh, caused growth in me. You know, yeah. it, it, and it, I, I find it impossible to imagine that you could, you know, everything you listen to gives you, I mean, there was this amazing, there's this amazing show about Dr. Dre and Jimmy Iovine um, on, on Netflix at the moment, these two great producers. And, you know, I knew Dr. Dre, I didn't know Jimmy Iovine and I watched it and it just blew my mind away. They, they, you know, the creativity and, and what they brought to the table and then also trans, translating that into business. And just from watching these couple of Netflix episodes, I found I grew as a musician and, and my, my horizons. Uh, Gabriella, you, your thoughts on this, this subject? Well, interestingly, I mean, I've, because I, I mean, uh, okay, so I started improvising when I was a baby. And then when I was eight, I went to a piano teacher in the US who basically told me not to improvise, that it wasn't worth anything. So it was my secret. Only in Venezuela did they know that I improvised because my encores used to be longer than the concerti when I, <laughs> as a kid, you know? Um, then when I studied in, at, uh, at the Royal Academy, people also didn't know I improvised because it was still my secret. So. It wasn't until Argerich heard me improvise that she then said, you have to share this with the world. So it was, I had my own Nike, just do it moment with her, thanks to her, you know? Yeah. So, so that changed everything, that validation of saying, this is worth something and you're not really being yourself unless you show it you know, to the world and you share it with the world. And that for me was a moment of, 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 of a, a holistic, let's say healing, because I was finally able to be the animal that I am, which is a performer, but also the creator. Mm. And it's only the industry which creates these boxes. We don't create that. The public doesn't create that. The public wants you to be yourself and to give the best of yourself. And if, and why, do, why are we called, you know, revolutionary and avant-garde and, and, you know, uh, the, the strange animals when, Mozart and Beethoven and Bach, you know. Well, this is, this is they, kind of what fascinates me how there was just, if you look at the history of music, it goes like this, and then there's a little rut in the 20th century where it, it became less on vogue. But the, the most celebrated performers were those who were able to improvise, who, who did do fresh things. And, you know, so I, I think it's, it's wonderful, actually, we might be returning to, to the norm, if you will. Um, so it, we're really old fashioned. 
<laughs> Absolutely. Um, a question for you both as, as composers, because you, uh, as I sort of phrased it in the introduction, you are now both starting to build bodies of work as composers. Do you, um, let's maybe start with Stuart, do you find currently that you are able to express yourself in as fulfilling a manner for you personally as a composer as you are as an interpreter and as an improviser? Or does it exceed it already? You know, like, what's your relationship to, as, as, as an outlet? Um, I very much love the amount of composing that I'm doing. Hmm. And um, I have to go back to the, um, you know, the Sonata-thon analogy where, you know, you have with, with Beethoven, with the 32, each sonata, there were different tries of expressing different, different shadows, different corners of his life. And I feel the same way with every um, piece that I write. It's, um, it's, it's that um, journal writing where it's your thought at that moment. Mm. And then the next composition is another adventure mm. and another, you know, self-discovery. Sure. Mm -hmm. Gabriella, you, what, what's your yeah. relationship to composition at the moment? Well, I just wish there was more time because it's it's so consuming. And um, I just find I don't have enough time for, for everything. And mm -hmm. I, I think as, as a woman, and nobody really talks about how women and men live these careers and the, these lives differently and how we seem to want different things or have a different rhythm or, you know, there are different stages in life mm -hmm. as well. And at this point, you know, as a woman, um, I just turned 51 and I'm thinking, you know, what is the rest of my life going to look like? And where do I want to put my energies? There are, there are certain things I'm very, very passionate about. And, and music for me is, is a vehicle to communicate more than anything. You know, I don't come from a tradition of musical families and music in the home and great intellectuals, you know, who listen to Beethoven and, and you know, Schnicke. And mm -hmm. that's not and that's not my heritage. So for me, music is more than anything a tool that is just a very honest um, way to not only speak of who I am, but also of a broader picture and a, a broader um, you know, conversation. Mm. Um, so as a composer, I guess um, right now, I, I'm just in that moment where I feel really frustrated with with the, the expectations that in classical music, it has to sound a certain way, or there are certain parameters that have to be, you have to be within those parameters. And I just want to break those. And I think I am with my preludes. I, sometimes I'm sitting there playing them and I'm thinking, what style is this? I mean, I can't get away from the fact that Latin because that's there and mm. rhythm is just at the core of everything that I create. But I, I'm just like a, an amalgam of, of all kinds of influences and you can hear it in the music. So but it, it again, as, as a, well, both as you know, professional musician, but also as a music fan, I'd say one of the beauties of the age we live in is actually that we're kind of post stylistic. Yeah, yeah Harmony has been completely broken down and rebuilt again. And, and you kind of, I, I, as an observer of what you do, I would never think that you had to conform to any you know, I mean, it may be that someone said something to you at some point, but I don't see it that way. I, I think we're all very used to, I mean, look at hip hop, right? What I, I talk about Dr. Dre, we're used to hearing tracks where actually it's, it, you know, it's built on a riff, on a groove that was written 50 years beforehand, or maybe even 80 years beforehand. And then there's a new text and then there's like a beat that was actually from the 60s. And then there's like a sound that came from a year ago. And uh, we, we're, we're really used to that, that mashup. And, and again, if we look at the history of classical music, I can barely think of a of a creative artist who hasn't celebrated the the you know the growing opportunities. Look at look at the kind of globalization of the world in the early 20th century and what it did to Ravel and Gershwin and you know Stravinsky and on and on and on. So again, I think you're in the best possible uh, kind of tradition of saying that this is who I am. I want to draw on all of this. Anyway, it's 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 not about my perspective, Stuart. What do you think about what Gabriella just said about sort of stylistic questions? Um, I guess it's always something that um, composers always wrestle with, um, you know, as soon as you're, you know, as soon as you're with that manuscript paper, you know, once you have that, you know, instinct to write, to, um, to share some thought, yeah. it's, always, it's always a question of um, exactly what does this stay, you know, 
Mm. When, when you're looking at uh, looking at it from the frame as opposed to um, every brush stroke. As, and um, as, as, as creative artists, as composers, what do you most appreciate in uh, the musicians who perform your music? What, what, what kind of characteristics would you appreciate in someone who's, who's approaching your music? Gabriella, do you want to? Uh, I haven't had any play, anyone play my music yet because it basically I haven't. Oh, you're been, Latin control. I'm and, still and... keeping my baby to myself. I, I'm a very slow. I'm a mother, mother hen, hen mother. Uh, but what about your your Latin concerto, which you record and stuff? So there, I, you know, there are a couple of wonderful pianists who who have asked if you know they can play it. So I, that's the next step to to just finish polishing the score, and that requires time as well to then send it out into the world. But it's it's oh my gosh, it's so hard because you know, like with improvisation. I have a lot of people asking me if if someone can transcribe my improvisations because they want to play it or will I publish them? And there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them. And I keep saying no, because improvising is a different, it's not it's not meant to be permanent. Mm. And you know, the impermanence of it is what makes it so liberating. Mm. Uh, so it shouldn't be in physical form. The composition though, that's that's a different animal. That there you're really Ed, ed, etching, you know, now, forever. Mm. And it's, so it's hard for me to finish that process. There's I'm, a strand of Zen Buddhism in you there. I like that. It's, it's great. Like the impermanence <laughs> is the beautiful in it, you know. And yeah. Stuart, Stuart what, are you, what are your thoughts on that? On um, the question of um, interpreters, you know, when people are interpreting my music, what do I value? I value their curiosity. I value, um, I, I value, their um, confidence and self-awareness that they're bringing themselves to um, a piece that I wrote. And I'm learning so much from you know, what they bring. I haven't yet heard a pianist um, interpret my piano music. So that will be, that will be really interesting um, mm. what they come up with. Um, I've heard string players play my music. I heard orchestras. Uh, recently, I heard um, two vocalists um, interpret two um, art songs that I wrote. And, um, you know what what they do with the words and you know the melody i thought was um was fantastic and i loved uh i loved learning so much and just absorbing what they brought so um I've... that's a, it's a it's a tough question but um it's a, a it's a great journey but to answer <laughs> to answer your question simply what i really admire is what they bring yeah i i i always find it uh, enriching performing new music when you can speak to a composer because uh, you can take all those things that you can't ask Mozart and Brahms and, and you can ask them. And uh, there, I find there are two responses generally. One is the, the type of composer who's, who's incredibly detail oriented. It's like, I wrote that because I want to hear that. And then there's the other type who's like, well, you know, just do whatever you want. And there's, <laughs> there's a bit of me that loves that, but finds it really frustrating as well. Would you guys, if someone comes along and plays one of your pieces and it's faster than you asked for and it's completely different dynamics and articulation, would that bother you, uh, Stuart, start off? It would bother me. Um, I think <laughs> that, um, you know, I do, there are, you know, tempos, there are markings that I do, um, that I do put for a reason. Mm. And um, it was interesting. I was um, playing my um, piano quartet. Um, you know, this was the first time playing my own chamber work. And um, it was interesting, you know, just um, talking with the um, musicians. There, there was another group that played it a little, a little slower, but I really heard it in this fast tempo, mm. and you know, from the flowing. So it was, um, you know, interesting. You know, thinking to myself, yeah, I, I, I guess I am a bit of a tyrant when it comes to. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, but um, yeah, and I guess. Gabriella? Yeah. Um, I suppose. In, in, when I will be in that situation, I might also be a bit of a tyrant. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, look, if, if a score has very specific indications, then there is a reason for that. And I, I also try to respect that as much as possible yeah. with composers. Now, if it's, it's, if it's not very, you know, detailed, then I guess you, you have, you know, more or less free uh, license to do, you know? Because we, we all, you know, as interpreters, we all, we all face this as a, our first question. And I'm, I'm, as an interpreter, I always try and get as, as close to the text as is possible before right. deciding that I need to do it differently. It's like, why would I need to decide to do Beethoven differently if there's 
no good reason for it. So I take all the time I can to get into a tempo, a dynamic, a coloration or whatever you can. And I've never actually experienced once uh, having to reimagine it because the composer hadn't got it right. It's never happened to me. It happens sometimes that you then do a piece and people are used to a certain tradition and they say, well, that sounds different to the tradition. It's like, yeah, well, maybe I'm wrong, but I'm just trying to sort of bring to life what I saw on the page. So that's, that's why I'm always interested, particularly with the two of you who cover all the bases, improvisers, you know, interpreters and composers to, to, to hear your perspective. Um, I have one final question for you both, bearing in mind that this, this conversation is, is sort of within um, a professional development uh, week and we have uh, some, some young, young artists tuning in. If you were to give your younger selves a piece of advice mm -hmm. uh, about the, the life you're about to sort of undertake and, and the career, and it, actually it doesn't have to be about music, it could be about anything, but are there any sort of words of wisdom you'd love to give a young Gabby or a young Stuart? Um, Whichever one of you feels ready to answer, please go ahead. <laughs> oh, I have a list. <laughs> What's top of the list? <laughs> uh, don't go to a Catholic school. <laughs> that, 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 is, that is all boys. <laughs> okay. Number one. <laughs> Number no, two. Really? Oh, sorry. Go, no, no, go ahead, Stuart. <laughs> <laughs> Number two. Don't listen to any advice that says you can't mm. or it has never been done before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree with the first, yes. No, sorry, second. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, yes, that definitely. And I would, I would say to a, a very young Gabby, what you, what you are not getting in your education and at home and in your environment, look for it elsewhere. Look for those inspiring figures that will teach you and that will bring you into those worlds that you don't even know exist. But you need, I, I would have loved to have had inspiring figures in my life, really. Mm -hmm. And um, I now see how much I missed out on because I didn't have that. I wasn't in the right place. I wasn't in the right education and and I see how I'm trying to catch up all the time because I didn't have that upbringing I would have loved to have been raised in Europe in this kind of you know uh, aesthetic uh, uh, complete education and and to to have had that and I think that would have shaped me differently but at the same time things turn out as they do and 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 you make the best of it and, and you've I, done okay I'd say yeah, I <laughs> That's what my husband said. I know, I should stop playing, sorry. Well, listen, I, I can't tell you uh, what a, a personal privilege it is to, 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 to speak with two artists that I admire from the, from the very bottom of my heart. I, I find you both inspirational and I find that you both embody all that I love about music and all that I find kind of inspiring about being around musicians. So I, I thank you uh, for, for giving us uh, an hour of your time. And I, and I have to say also as, as music director of the NAC Orchestra, we are very proud and privileged that you're both part of our, our musical family. So, so thank you. And uh, a, a big thank you also to uh, uh, anybody and everybody who's tuned in today or is watching uh, on, on repeat in the future. There's plenty more uh, fascinating interviews to, to be found on the NAC website, as well as our NACO live concerts, the archives. Um, and, and much more. So please do uh, go exploring. Um, and when regulations allow, we will be back uh, performing for you. It looks like uh, the beginning of July, fingers crossed, and hopefully then we can get a nice kind of run into getting back to some kind of normality. So thank you for tuning in. Please stay safe. Uh, a huge thank you to Gabriella and Stuart and see you all very soon. Thank you, Alex. Thank you. Nicole. Thank you so much. Bye, Stuart.